Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 349. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I think you are going to be exceptionally glad that you are here today, and here's why. Because many of us are out there trying to build a business. You you might try to get the first one started. Well, I, I have with me today someone who who's done it a lot. And by a lot, I mean multiple times. And by multiple times, I mean more than once, but most importantly, I mean... He can share the information that you and I need to turn a business around, to get the business started, to make it happen, and to grow it probably larger than you may think about right now. You're like, what is that? How large? Well, larger than you're thinking, add a zero. Yeah, larger than that. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. What I want to share with you, though, is that I have a feeling that today is going to be so filled with information I'm hoping you're ready to take copious notes. Why do I say this? Because I have with me none other than Paul Oberschneider. Now, he is a seasoned startup entrepreneur, property financier. He has personally built businesses well worth over $200 million. He's been doing this a long time. So let me give you some ideas of what I mean by a long time and a lot of business. Have you ever started a bank credit department? Well, he has. Founded a mortgage company? Yep, talking about that too. Built the largest single branded real estate company across five countries in Central Europe. And I'm just beginning to tell you the experience that's about to be unloaded. So hopefully you are ready to receive it, take copious notes, because not only is he here, he's also going to talk to us about his book, whose title I love, because... I've never considered selling tacos in Africa, but he <laughs> has wrote a book about it. So help me welcome Mr. Paul Oberschneider. Paul, you there? Jay, th- thanks so much for uh, that great introduction. Yeah, I mean, it's great to be here, and thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, before we talk about the book, <laughs> Why Sell Tacos in Africa, which, by the way, yeah. is a title in and of itself, because I'm sure there's a story there. Before well, we- it's a, it- it's a quirky title. I mean, it's a metaphor, of course, but um, sure. shall I tell you the secret now or shall I hold off? No, no, no. We got to <laughs> hold off. We're going to make them wait for that. Uh, okay. I've gotta, this right. being your first time here, though, I want to ask you the yeah. same question I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? Yes, yeah, shoot. All right. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, the Hulk, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common, chief among them. Occasionally, you know, we get dressed up and we use our special yeah. skills and abilities to go out yeah. there and serve people. Also, like superheroes, entrepreneurs have a beginning. And before, I mean, if you think about it, before Spider-Man was Spider-Man, it was Peter Parker. He was just a kid going to school, probably just trying to make sure he got his good grades and got, you know, those next pictures. He was just trying to make ends meet. Then he gets something intervenes in his life and then he becomes what we know today as Spider-Man. So my question is as follows. Before all of the businesses, before building the real estate company, before growing the chain of 19 fast food restaurants, before all of these things that you've done, even before the book, Why Sell Tacos in Africa, what we want to know is who is Paul Oberschneider? (laughs) The Lone Ranger, the masked man. <laughs> hey, <laughs> for those, for the, for, I've da- I'm dating myself now, but you know, for those that can remember that far back, you know, um, I'd be that guy with the mask riding the white horse, and that would have been me, you know. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. And where does this story begin? <clears throat> well, in black and white, of course. Um, you know, this I is. Like I'm <laughs> I'm a product of the late 1950s. I was born in 1958, so I grew up in rural um, Illinois in the cornfields, and um, you know, it was it was a black and white world. It was the Ozzie and Harriet world. It was it was Father Knows Best and Dick Van Dyke, and um, you know. That's what I grew up on. And uh, so that's where it all started was in the suburbs of Chicago. Got it. Got it. OK. So now were you one of those kids who say started with, you know, you were trying to sell candy to or the newspaper routes, you were selling candy in school. You Were you entrepreneurial from the beginning or? <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah, no, I. <laughs> I, I hated work, really. I mean, even homework. I wasn't a very good student, but I was I was pretty adept at, at at getting kids to pay me to ride my bike and stuff like that. So uh, nice. I remember remember one poor kid. He, <laughs> I think I inherited his father's entire silver dollar collection because I, every time he rode my bike, I charged him like a silver dollar. So at, at one point I had like this bag of all his money. And of course, you know, his mom and my mom talked all the time and I had to return the funds. But, um, that was, uh, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> I'm liking this. Okay. No, I, I just want to be I clear. Had to, I had to his money back. Yeah. I, I just want to be clear. You were like the original Uber, right? That's what you're trying to tell me. It was just your bike. I was, <laughs> I was just trying to make a deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay. All right. So take us from the, the, from the bike entrepreneur all the way through today. What does that journey look like? I mean, how do you go from bikes to 19 fast food restaurants, man? <laughs> Well, I mean, through the trenches, basically. I mean, here's the deal. I, I mean, I, I see so many guys out there pitching and selling smoke and, you know, they're going to make me rich and they're going to do, you know, there's so many schemes out there and so many people claiming that they can help you. And I'll tell you, you know, I'm not one of those guys. I, I'm just here to tell my story. And my story is that it's, there are no secret magic beans, you know, the, there are no tricks. It's it's step by step, and there are certain things that you have to do. Um, most of which I didn't do in the beginning, and I <laughs> my my journey's a bit uh, rocky. So so <clears throat> you know, being a, a kid from Chicago, I I end up on the board of trade um, as a summer job, and uh, work for some pretty cool companies. That was back when you know trading existed on um there was open outcry systems trading existed on trading floors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. today that's all been replaced by computers sadly but um back then it, that's where it happened and those were really cool places to work um very exciting full of adrenaline lots of crazy people and um what was a summer job basically um ended up being a full-time job because my dad died my first year in university. So I had to come home and, uh, and I took that job and basically stayed and, um, hmm. tried to go to school at night, uh, at Loyola university and found that to be absolutely impossible because I was more interested after the end of the trading day to go down to, you know, the, the local pub or the sign of the trader as we called it. And, hang out with the big boys and then go out and spend the night with them. So, um, you know, I was attracted to sort of all that risk and danger and staying out all night. And so I didn't go back to school. I didn't finish my degree at that time. And I got caught up in this whole, you know, scene. Now, you know, if you remember the end of the seventies and the early eighties, it was full on. Everything was permissible. Um, as long as you showed up, for work the next day, it was, it was okay, mm. you know, and, and, um, and, 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 and that's the way it was. I mean, I remember my pit boss saying, you know, if you want to soar with the Eagle, if you want to hoot with the owls, you better be in here in the morning soaring with the Eagles. You've just got to be here. Now, the problem with that was, um, I just didn't know when to stop. 
<laughs> I see. I see. Got it. <laughs> you know, I just, I just had too much fun, and uh, and I didn't want it to stop. And so, while a lot of my colleagues and friends could switch off and say, "Okay, well, it's ten o'clock. I got to go home now," you know, I'd be like, "Well, where are we going now?" And um, and and when you're young and you're twenty years old, you can do that. Um, and because physically you can. Um, but I was getting to into some really bad habits, and and. I went from kind of one good job to the next better job. And I ended up in New York um, trading on the New York Stock Exchange, the New York Futures Exchange, and then the American Stock Exchange. I traded equity futures and options. And um, and in Chicago, I was a little bit more reserved because that's where I was from and that's where my family was from. But when I went to New York, you know, all bets were off because nobody <laughs> – <laughs> nobody knew me so I could be as nuts nutty as I wanted to be and that's exactly what happened um it was you know studio 54 limelight all the clubs that one hears about or read about and, you know I was I was there all the time and you know I barely saw the inside of my apartment and you know <clears throat> for quite a while I tried to to burn both ends of the candle and eventually it practically knocked me, well it did it knocked me off my feet got it um and it finished me off and i <laughs> i was out of a job uh out of money um humiliated embarrassed i wanted to hide under a rock and and you know i had never asked anybody for help got it ever ever i hadn't been taught that skill i thought you had to know everything by the time you were 12 <laughs> and, um, you know, so inside, I was just this little scared kid, you know, who who just had a big job for a while and I blew it. And, you know, so, you know, who wh what do you do? You know, I mean, I was at the end of that bridge and um, and that was a pretty dark moment for me. So, um well, well, mm. that's actually kind of common in most superhero slash entrepreneur stories is that there's always, you know, the, the, the hero of the story starts out and you see what life is normally. And then there's this catalyst. There's this change. There's this thing that happens that causes him or her to reflect in some way, shape or form or or discover what we like to call their superhero ability. And then there's this this moment where it's like, OK, well, what am I going to do with this thing? So uh, I'm curious to know. What was it that uncovered or what happened for you that uncovered, hey, I could be an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I wish I was I wish I was uh, honestly, I wish I was that clever and I wish I could say <laughs> to you, well, that's that's how that's what I, you know, I, I went home and I thought, gee, Paul, you know look at what you can, it, it didn't happen like that at all. I, I mean, I really, so I, I had to clean up my the mess. And, um, and I had to ask for help. And, um, when I was at that dark moment at that precipice, I guess I sort of, you know, got on my knees and, 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 you know, I don't think there was anyone in the room or at least just my mental monsters, but, you know, I, I asked God for help and, um, and I ended up in a 12 step recovery program, which 30 years later, I'm still part of. So I've been clean and sober now for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much. And, um, you know, that was the beginning of everything for me because um, to do that properly and, you know, then now there are 12 step programs for everything these days. But <laughs> but but to do that, to do that properly, the one key ingredient is is honesty and being honest with yourself primarily, um, and understanding what the problem is. And I had never really had the ability to do that. So, um, I had to really dig deep and, and really come to grips with, you know, who I was and the problem that I had. And I had to be able to look at myself in the mirror. Once I got that, once, once I was able to swallow that, um, that dose of humiliation as my friends were all getting married and buying nice big houses. I was living in some guy's basement trying to get sober. Um, once I was okay with that, then things started to happen. You know, mm -hmm. I put myself, I went back to school. 
Um, I worked during the day. I worked at night. I, I went my I, I went back to school. I finished like three years of college in one year. Wow. Uh, I went where I worked really hard. I had no money, so I was driving my Honda 350 in in Connecticut in the winter time in the snow. And listen to this with a woolly cap and swimming goggles because I couldn't afford a helmet or anything. You know, I mean, it was really ridiculous, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, driving down the highway to the university in the snow on a motorcycle, you know, but, you you know, you do anything when you want to achieve. So I needed that degree and I wanted to finish it because I wanted to be honest with myself. So, you know, that's what I did. And I <clears throat> once I had done that, um. I thought that the true path to success was, well, I better go get my MBA, you know, hmm. Is, isn't that what everybody does? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so I, uh, I applied to, to 12 schools and, uh, you know what happened? <laughs> 13 rejected you? Yeah, <laughs> certainly 12 did. Yeah, got um, it, got it. Totally understood. You know, certainly 12 of them did. You know, I mean, I had a few hopeful interviews, but, you know, my 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 pedigree was not exactly MBA cate category. And right. um, but one but one that 13th one did. Oh, OK. And and, you know, it was a really special moment because. Um, and I remember it clearly, it was a spring day in Boston and, uh, you know, and the birds were chirping and the daffodils were out and everything looked beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, and I came out of this, I came out of, seriously, I came out of this meeting and the sky parted and, and, and I, and I was really, really proud of myself for what I, you know, what I had done on my own. Mm -hmm. And. And, and that gave me um, a certain degree of confidence, um, which I'd never had before. And at the time, um, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, suggested, you know, well, before you go off to get your grad degree, why don't you go and um, retrace and look up your family roots in Estonia, in Central and Eastern Europe, which is where my father um, had been from. And you remember, I said he died when I was younger. So, um, so I I said, that's a great idea. So I packed everything up <clears throat> and, um, I had about $400 in my pocket. I, I wasn't expecting to stay more than a few weeks. Um, I didn't know anybody there. I didn't speak the language. I was just going on a, on a family finding excursion. And, um, I never came back. <laughs> <laughs> okay yes. i got lost i got lost so you know i mean i thought you know i thought my path was to go to graduate school and i thought that was the a to z path that everybody has to take but i found that my path was actually much different than that you know got it got it yeah. The the path to success, I I mean, well, uh, I don't think anyone's got a perfect map, but we we always think. I haven't found anyone who's said yet, yeah, this is the path I planned, and this is exactly how it happened, and 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 it went, you know, straight arrow all the way up all the time. So it you were you've obviously at this point were open to receiving new input and going in di completely different directions. So how does that? How did that lend itself to you getting even the first business started? You know, what's interesting about business is that oftentimes it comes from unexpected places. Oftentimes you can have a plan. You have an idea of what you are going to do, how it's going to happen, all these other things. And lo and behold, everything you thought was true isn't true. And more importantly, you, you have to adjust. And once you adjust, well, watch out. Because the marketplace is always telling us exactly what it wants. And if we are receptive entrepreneurs, we can take advantage of opportunities long before others even begin to see it. That's exactly what's happening here. In fact, I've recently discovered 
a new opportunity, a new opportunity that is literally changing the way I approach real estate, the way that all of these things that I've ever done are currently happening. Obviously, I'm going to be sharing that with you, but if you want to find out about it, you need to go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon. Last time, it's cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon. Because right now, the marketplace is indeed telling all of us entrepreneurs what it wants. If you want to find out what it is, go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon. And well, you'll be on the list for early notification. Now, let's get back to the rest of this story. Well, like Forrest Gump, you, you know the movie, right? So, <laughs> I so aware. Yeah. I, I, I kind of think of my story as like, Wolf of Wall Street meets Forrest Gump because, um, it, it, you know, I love Forrest because as a character, because he, you know, he's not very bright. He, he doesn't bring a lot to the table, but he's, you know, he's just honest and he's open minded and willing and he shows up, you know, he just shows up for whatever's on the table. He's there. And, you know, I think that part of success is just showing up for the party. You know, if you're not there, you'll you'll never find out what could have happened. And uh, I was on the town hall square of Tallinn, Estonia in 1992. And this Russian kid came up to me and we started a conversation. He said, hey, you know, you're American, so you probably know business. Can you help me write this business plan? And, um, and I, you know, I didn't know anybody. I, I, I was friendly with the guy. I said, sure. So, so. We did it on his computer. We did it in English, and it was only like three, four pages. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't very complicated. But you know, the guy takes this to the bank. He takes it to the bank, um, and he gets a loan. (laughs) (laughs) Uh oh. And he he comes back then, like the next day or whatever, the next week, and he says, "Paul, I got this loan." He says, "What do I owe you?" And and I thought, I don't. Oh me? <laughs> oh me? What oh, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. I said, I don't know, five five hundred dollars. Coffee? <laughs> right. Yeah. He, he pays. So he pays me five hundred bucks. Now I have nine hundred dollars. What a great return! I mean, I just showed up, and the next thing you know, and you know where the story is going to go. His friend comes to me, right, and says, "I heard you did this for Sergey. Can you do the same for me?" So I did it for him, and bingo, he goes to the bank or one of the banks and gets a loan for his business and comes back and says, Paul, I got the loan. What do I owe you? Now, you know, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't born in Illinois for nothing. You know, <laughs> I mean, I said, well, you know, a thousand dollars, of course. So he pays me. And well, this goes on for the entire summer. By the end of the summer, I've got stacks of cash and shoe boxes under my bed because I wasn't putting any money in the bank because 30 banks had failed at the time. And, you know, and I was leaving anyway. And, uh, you know, so I have all this cash under my bed in this cold water flat that I'm renting. And, uh, it's just a bed and two chairs basically. Right. And, um, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to write my grad school and I'm going to ask them if I can come next year. Well, I did that for two years and then they stopped writing back to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, you know, they just figured I wasn't interested. And by then I'd made so much money doing this. But, you know, mind you, in these in these sort of blue sky or, you know, emerging markets, the windows of opportunity are – can, can actually narrow quite quickly. So in the beginning, I, if I had tried to do this in New York or Chicago, I wouldn't have made a dime, you know, um, right. because lots of people do that. Um, you know, it's just a common, you know, anybody can do that. But back then it was sort of a special skill and all these banks were just starting up and, you know, people were talking about business plans and things that they had never seen before you know, in the legacy of the Soviet Union. And um, so so what I was doing was quite novel. and But that only lasted for a short period of time. And of course, what happens is that because I was there doing that, I get a knock on the door. And um, a guy who's now a very good friend of mine comes and asks me, he says, are you the guy writing all these business plans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Love I it. Said, I said, oh, I'm in trouble. You know, and uh, turns out that he's one of these young entrepreneur gunslinger bankers, you know, um, 
in starting a bank with his buddies and says, well, you know, if you are, I'd like you to come and join us. And, you know, I need help building our credit department. So that's how that all happened. And, you know, we didn't know anything about banking. Is You know, I mean, all I knew was don't bounce checks. And <laughs> that's a good start, though. But yeah, well, very good start. Didn't didn't work before. But um, so so, you know, with the Price Waterhouse Cooper's credit handbook, we were always just about a chapter ahead of our customers. Um, and, <laughs> and we 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 did that for a year until until um, my friend decided that he'd had enough and he was getting a little bit tired of sharing the spoils with me and um, said, well, OK. That's it. Thanks very much. And, you know, I was at one of those places again. I, I had the, I had one of those uh oh moments, um, you know, uh, out of a job, not for being incapacitated, but for working really hard and doing a good job. And, um, you know, I didn't know what was next. And um, so I think everybody sort of expected me to dash off and run home. But now I had been here for three years and there really wasn't much to go back to. So, um, I decided to stay and we, we, I took my PA from, from the bank and another guy and, um, we, uh, we started buying and renovating and flipping apartment units and, you know, we would do one and we would roll it into the next and we did it and rolled it into the next and, you know, we built up a little capital and then we started hiring guys to help us. So we started to build this real estate agency. It started with one or two people. And by the end of 10 years, we were close to 400 people in 35 different offices across seven different countries. <laughs> I love and it. it just, it just kind of grew. And, you know, we did it with sticks and tape. We didn't have a lot of money, um, but we were like family. I mean, we were, we were all misfits and, you know, we were, we, I don't know why, but we hired people that just, you know, they weren't part of the club. And right. um, because of that, we all had to, we all had this thing that we just had to prove that we could do what we were doing and we did it better than everybody. And, um, you know, we had summer day parties, we had winter day parties, we had birthday parties, we did everything together. We worked seven days a week, 24 seven. And, um, I think in 15, 16 years out of all those people, I only lost four people. Wow. Um, yeah. No, nobody wanted to leave. We were just having so much fun. And of course, you know, with, with all that information coming through our offices, because we were doing <clears throat> valuations for banks, we were property managers, we were residential and commercial brokers. We just, you know, the part of me just kept building stuff. So instead of building two, three apartments at a time, now we were building, you know, dozens, we were build, we were buying big land tracks across um, Central and Eastern Europe. We were building hotels. Um, and, you know, one day my very good friend who worked with me comes in and says, Oh, look, this is where we're going to build our first grocery store. You know? So from one day to the next, I became a shopping center developer. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's so that's how it sort of happens. You know, it was we, we built a basket of businesses around a core business, you know, um, all sort of vertically integrated, um, sharing off each other, but equally independent. Um, so that's how and, and we leveraged our time, um, our knowledge base by integrating them the way they were and with the financial capital that was coming out of the global markets. So we were on a rising tide in a very shallow marketplace. Yeah. 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 I, I can hear that. I mean, some of the times when, well, one, I've, I've been to Estonia, so I, I've seen it, been there, felt the cold, that's for sure. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> and at the same time, I've also been to Belize. Uh, which is, you know, over yeah. in Central America. And some yes. of the things that I hear you're saying is what I see when I'm there or in other uh, markets where they're just not as mature financially or their infrastructure is not the same. And and I'm like, yeah, this this sounds, you know, 
you know, mm. very, very familiar to me. It's, it's like, you know, I, I think in as a U.S. citizen, we don't really understand how developed we are and how much opportunity there is in other places. And until you yeah. go there and someone, well, says, hey, can you write a business plan? And, and over here, we're just like, uh, yeah, give me a napkin. It's really simple. Yeah. And over there, it's like, no, this is a valuable yeah, this is a yeah. valuable thing. You don't yeah. understand what we'll, you just we'll, did for me. Yeah, we'll pay you a lot of money for that. But, you know, it's funny, though, too, though, because you do have your sort of emerging markets in America. And they're, you know, they're kind of uh, they're kind of in in the central and middle western part of your country. <laughs> right. You know, you've got the institutions on the East Coast. You have the institutions on the West Coast. Um, and then everything in the middle, except for, let's say, Chicago. Um, kind of gets left behind. And, and, and uh, I mean, the, I, I, I'm not going to get into it now, but I think there's some really interesting opportunities in places as, as, as remotely as, as Arkansas, you know, for goodness sakes, Fayetteville, uh, Little Rock and places like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's absolutely uh, pockets, and and I, I get that. So let, let's ask this question because sure. I'm sure somebody wants to know what possesses one uh, who has managed to put themselves in a position of will uh, retirement comfort, mm. etc., to then fund uh, a write a book and then name it mm. "Why Sell Tacos in Africa." <laughs> hmm. Wow. All right. So now you have to let me finish the story, though. Oh, okay. To get the, Sounds great. To get to get there. So anyway, to, to, to just fast forward, we, we were not in 2006, 2007, the markets were just, you know, they were flying everywhere. I mean, not just where I was, but around the world globally, we'd, we'd never seen this cocktail of liquidity ever. And, um, you know, you guys experienced the fallout of that, but, you know, we were riding the wave as well. And, um, in 2006, I get a phone call from a from a Finnish private, you know, from Finland, Finnish private equity firm, and they wanted to buy one of my businesses. And um, and when I put the phone down, I thought, you know, the Finns have this reputation of always coming into the markets when everything is perfect, you know, when 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 everything has been de-risked, when 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 the opportunity is no longer the opportunity, you know, and I put the phone down and I was in the middle of a fundraising exercise in London for a Central Eastern European property fund. And I stopped everything and I thought, you know what? It's time to go. It's time to get out. So Mm -hmm. we started liquidating things in 2006, 2007. And by the end of 2000 or in the middle of 2008, one week before the crisis, we sold our last business. and. People thought we were absolutely mad as hatters because, you know, the markets were still going up and we were getting out. And um, one of my competitors actually went public the week that I got out. And um, Mm. I remember the journalist. I still have the picture on my wall. I've got this smirky grin on my face and like I know something. And I I really didn't. I was just so happy to be out. Uh, He says, you know, aren't you getting out a bit too early? And. Um, you know, I said something, but, um, a week later the markets crashed globally. So, um, I was really, really, really fortunate. And, um, so that was 2008. It took me a few more years to sort of unwind my, where my office and all the stuff and, uh, you know, ended up kind of moving to London in 2011. Um, but, for the most part, I was retired after 2008 with a lot of time on my hands. And, you know, I, I did what everybody would do. I, you know, spent money, enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I played a lot of high goal polo in Argentina and America and uh, and um, mostly yeah. in England. England, And, uh, I, I, you know, I've got a place down in Argentina. And I'm still quite involved in all that, but um, I don't do that anymore. Um and 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 then I started to kind of look at the stuff on my wall and all the little trinkets I've had from all these years of my success. And, and I started asking myself that philosophical question, you know, was that really me? Did mm-hmm. I really did I really do that? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Because it just because it just started to seem so long ago. 
And I think a lot of entrepreneurs that find success and then get out um, successfully, you know, they have a moment where they think, could I really do this again? Mm. Um, and they start questioning that. Um, so that was one part of what was going through my head. The other part of what was going through my head was, um, you know, people that have heard my story have always said, you know, Paul, you need to write a book. And, and I never, <laughs> I, 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 I never really thought about that. But, but then as my son started to get older, um, you know, he's, he's about 14 now and he, you know, to, to him, I'm probably the weirdest guy in the world, you know, to a 14 year old. So, <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, you know, I'm not very cool at all, but so he doesn't want to listen too much to what I have to say. But so I wanted to write something for him. And originally this book was going to be called something like 33 things. My, I wish my father had told me. And, um, and, and I tried to write that and it didn't work at all. And it was very contrived and it didn't, it didn't sound right. It didn't feel right. And, um, so I said, well, I, I'm just going to write my story. And, um, so I did. And that's how that kind of happened. And then I took, once I did that, um, and that's more of a business infused memoir, I, I, I took the business parts out and I turned it into a second book, which is the book you've got now, which is Why Sell Tacos in Africa. And the title, now I'm going to give the title away. The, t- the title has really nothing to do about, you know, selling tacos in Africa. What it, it's a metaphor for two things, really. It's a metaphor for um, doing things differently hmm. than one would expect. And it's a metaphor for finding opportunity um, in the most unlikely of places, especially in uncontested or as the familiar and popular term is in blue ocean markets. Um, and, um, and it's a story about my journey and how I built my businesses in Central and Eastern Europe. And the touching part of all of it is that my son has actually read the book. Yay. So I, I accomplished my mission, really. And, <laughs> yes. You know, so someone asked me the same question um, on LinkedIn the other day and said, why, why would a guy like you waste their time and write a book and try to sell it? You know, what, what's that all about? And, uh, you know, the answer to that is, well, I, I'm, I, I do, I'm doing this because I can. And and I'm doing it for another reason, which is I really wrote this whole thing as a uh, as a book for someone else. And it just so happened that once I did that, I thought, well, actually, you know what? It's not a bad book. It's got a quirky title. Um, I'll, I'll put it out there and let other people read it. Because the one thing for sure is when I was doing all this stuff, I had help. I mean, people helped me. They went out of their way to help me. I learned over time how to ask for help, and um, and and I found that people are very willing to give it to you. So um, it's my turn, you know, and I'm just sharing the things that I learned um, to those people that are remotely interested in learning how to make big changes and do some of those things that I did. Indeed, indeed, and definitely big changes because – I mean, probably I, I would say one of the most, I guess, um, striking things about all of the things that you have managed um, to 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 do is to change your identity uh, mm. multiple times. Is I mean, and that's one of those things that the human <laughs> that as humans we resist. This is who I am. I conform to this, and in, and in order to become so many different businesses and have them and own them and i mean from where you started to where you are i can only imagine what the mental emotional spiritual and any other journey you've gone through uh has been because that that identity how you look at yourself how you see yourself how you want the world to see you how you see yourself amongst the world all of those things have had to change yeah. a lot to that's right these. Absolutely. You, you, you're you absolutely right. And and it can be quite scary. And I think that you need to have tremendous faith, no matter what it is, whether it's spiritual or whether, you know, no matter what it is, I I, I have that. And, and that came out of, you know, being in those dark places. But I think without that faith, I'd be scared to death every day. But, but, <laughs> right. but, but, you know, but it's that faith that, that, that allows you 
to know that success is right around the corner, whether you can see it or not. And that if you just show up, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Yep. Totally appreciate that. So for those that have, um, you know, listened this far, and I'm sure they're, they've been taking notes. I know I've been taking notes the entire time. Just like, oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. They probably want to get access to more of this. And if not all of it, by being able to pick up a copy of the book or just follow you wherever you are and, and figure out what's going on. What's well, Jay, be- J- go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you, um, the best place to do that. Well, obviously you can get me on LinkedIn. Um, that's easy enough. And it's just Paul Oberschneider. And, um, and, and then of course, Facebook. Um, but more importantly, I have my, my site is www. Paul Oberschneider. And it's all one word. That's P A U L O B E R S C H N E I D E R.com. Paul Oberschneider. And if you go there, you can download the book for free. I'll give you the book for free. There it is. Uh, and if you, you know, you know, if you like it, great. Or, or you can buy the hard copy on Amazon. But you can, I'll give you the book for free, digitally, um, or you know, an ebook. Um, if you just go on my site, and and if you like it, leave me a rock star review on on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like you there. I get that. I totally yeah. get that. I totally get that. That's excellent, and that's a that's a generous offer. So let let me ask you this question as we wind up here there's a number of people who have been listening this entire time and you know you've been 200 million many would say it was like well beyond what they were thinking uh the the building something that spans with 400 people working there that's that's well beyond what many are thinking um, you know, 10, 20 people is also that, you know, some that are listening are just at the 10 and 20 people stage and going, man, that, that, that's a lot. But there's also this other person out there right now who's not yet started. And let's say that they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store right now. They think, man, I want to do this entrepreneur thing. I think it's in me. I think I have what it takes. But at the same time, Paul, they, they have that that voice. And I know you've done battle with that voice. And it's that voice that comes up and often tells us what we can't do, how we're not going to be good. And who are we to think that we could dare to be that great? And for some people, they're actually related to that voice. Mm. So my question to you is as follows. To that person, let's pretend for a second that that person is standing in front of you right now. They're listening. Mm. They're ready. And they've made the commitment that they're going to actually follow through in the next 24 to 48 hours on what you say, what would Mm. you tell them to do? Just close your eyes and take that step, really. And if that voice comes and taps on your shoulder, fire him. Yes. (laughs) Yes, I like that. Fire. Just get get rid of him. Tell him him that he's fired. You know, and you probably need to do that every day for a long time, but eventually he'll get the message. Yeah. Yeah. That voice can be persistent. They do keep showing up to work. <laughs> oh, they, they, they show up every they show up with me too. That you know, it's just not as loud. Um but you know, as I said, and I and I would also encourage that young person to really dig deep and, and find some find find a belief system or 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 something outside of themselves, um, a power, a faith that they can fall back on, because it's in, it's it's in those rough times that that uh, you know everybody's a superhero when things are easy, but um, you know it's when things are rough that you gotta get up and get going. Indeed, sir. Indeed, mm-hmm. very much so. I definitely want to thank you uh, though for taking the time. Jay, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You were thank quite, you. <laughs> well, you're actually quite quite welcome because it's not always we can get such knowledge, wisdom, and insight to be shared with us here at the Cashflow Diary. Well, thanks for having me on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means go get a free copy. You have no excuse. Free copy of Why Sell Tacos in Africa? Because you should, because you can, because, well, dare I say that your greatness is locked up inside you and waiting to come out? And now you have a way to go possibly let it out and become exactly what you were always meant to be. It's been fun talking to you guys today. 
I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.